Welcome, everybody, to the Ray Shasho Show, brought to you by the Publicity Works Agency. Each week, Ray spotlights in-depth interviews with legendary and up-and-coming authors and music artists. Ray also features the movers and the shakers of the music and publishing industries and suggests important methods for getting the most out of your public relations and marketing needs. Please welcome music journalist, author, and entrepreneur, Ray Shasho. Hello once again, everyone. I'm Ray Shasho, and welcome to the show where we spotlight legendary and up-and-coming music artists and authors. Brought to you by the Publicity Works Agency. Call us today at 941-877-1552 or visit www.publicityworksagency.com. Remember, we shine only when we make you shine. Our very special guest today is Canadian powerhouse drummer Corky Lang, who is essentially associated with rock and roll folklore and as one of the elite drummers in the world. Lang is a longtime member for hard rock heavy metal giants Mountain and the blues rock power trio of West Bruce and Lang. But Lang's musical collaborations are seemingly endless, a list that includes alliances with John Lennon, Jack Bruce, Meatloaf, Noel Redding, Mahogany Rush, Ten Years After, Ian Hunter, Mick Ronson, Bo Diddley, and Government Mule, to name a few. Lang is also a producer and composer. Corky Lang has recently added a brand new chapter to his illustrious musical career. Lang's most recent project is a fascinating collaboration with two internationally acclaimed professors intermingling the decree of genetic engineering with a rock opera music scheme. The concept album entitled Playing God is performed by the Perfect Child, an incredible ensemble of musicians and singers. At the core of the rock opera is Corky Lang, who astounds instrumentally lyrically and vocally. The album concept is brilliant and the music is colossal. It's an awe-inspiring rock musical production and a cross between Welcome to My Nightmare, The Wall, and the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Recently, Corky Lang has been on tour with Corky Lang Plays Mountain, sitting in with K2, Peter Barron, Ken Sidati, and Joe Venti, a band saluting Mountain's music for a couple of gigs during 2014 and 2015, reminding Corky how much he liked playing Mountain songs the way they were originally written. Now he's looking at touring both Europe and the U.S., celebrating the Mountain Legacy. On their European tours, Corky is joined by Joe Venti, formerly of Leslie West Band on bass and vocals, and Phil Baker of Uriah Heap Legends and Pulse Echoes of Floyd on guitar and vocals. In November 2015, they toured the U.K., and in February 2016, Germany playing the Immortal Mountain Classics and throwing in some West Bruce and Lang and Cream for good measure. Playing God, the rock opera, will also return to Helsinki in April. Corky says, the drums are the best instrument in the world. When you're a kid, you go to your dad and say, Dad, I want to grow up and I want to be a drummer. Your dad says, you've got to choose one or the other. Welcome to the show. Legendary drummer, composer, producer, singer, and member of classic rock legends Mountain and West Bruce and Lang, Mr. Corky Lang. Welcome, oh, Corky. Thank, thank you, Ray. Thank you. I still like that 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 joke about the drummer. If you can't, you got to choose one or the other, you know. Because uh, when you play drums, you really you you do never grow up, you know. I think Levon Helm once said, "Why grow up if you don't have to?" You know. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. On on the drums here, you, it's it's just fun. It's just a lot of fun, and yeah, there's technique and there's a lot of rehearsal and practice. But when you get into the zone, yeah, it's it's a wonderful place to be. It's a wonderful place to be. So I feel very blessed overall. Well, I mean, at your, you know, as you as you you know you uh, suddenly take a journey in the last few years that I've been working, I don't mm-hmm. even notice it. I like you know I don't even notice. There's no work involved. It's just. Right. It's just all play, Ray, and uh, and your support for the opera out of the shoot was really, really very, very valuable, and it was wonderful. Gave us a little shot of incentive, and the opera is still going on. It's it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful project, and you know it's got. I think it's got legs, so to speak. You know, I think it's got legs for the years to come. But uh, yeah, yeah, it's great to be here, and like Keith Richards said, it's great to be anywhere. But. Um, Again, it's um, 
It's a Wonderful Life. I think that's the Christmas. Uh, that's the Christmas movie, right? It's a Wonderful Life. Well, I watched that last night, as a matter of fact, and it'll probably be on 150 more times before Christmas. <laughs> yeah, it will be. It's just to remind. It's just to remind people that hey, if you're not dirt napping and you got right. a pulse, don't worry. Everything will work out. And if it yep. doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. But in most cases, yep. you know, time takes care of all that stuff. You know. And it's uh, it's Christmas and happy holidays to you and and, 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 and same to you, Gordy. Same to you. Yeah. And you always you, you always have a positive attitude about things, and you've got so many logs on the fire going on. And of course, you know the big one, uh, which I love, is is the rock opera. And uh, we met in um, in Florida. Uh, I live in Florida. To the listening audience, we met in Venice, and right before the kickoff of the rock opera. We chatted about it, and I thought it was a fantastic idea. The album, I gave it five stars, uh, and you've been performing. It, it, first of all, the, uh, congratulations on and, on touring. I mean, that, that was a tremendous feat, just touring the rock opera. Yeah, that was ambitious. I got to hand yeah. it to Tuja uh, Takala, who, like, again, was the leader and, uh, mm-hmm. and, uh, and the conductor of yeah, there was 20-odd people in the cast, and right. we didn't have, like, major, you know, um, uh, monumental management. She just took it on herself to, to, it was really running on very good vibes. You know, it was just, you know, to get all those people, by the way, from all over the world, to right. get together and, you know, and just put it across uh, in different countries, in different locations. Yeah, it was quite something. I have to say, it's going to go down. It was certainly in my life one of the most foremost mm-hmm. events ever, 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 Ray. And um, I again, I just feel very blessed. It's it's something that came out of nowhere, and it's going somewhere. So I, right. I, I'm, I'm thrilled. I'm thrilled about that. You know. Talk a little bit. I mean, I know how the, with the inception of the, the opera started and, and how it all came about. Tell our listening audience how it, it actually came to play. Well, I'll tell you what, um, over the uh, previous to that, um, I was touring, I was doing some touring, and I was up in Canada, I had to go and hang with my son who was going to university in Toronto, and I was asked uh, over a period of time to do some guest lecturing, mostly about uh, the international marketing of music, etc. My brother was a, 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 he's a professor at McGill in Montreal, and he asked me to come and just talk to the, talk to the, the students about about uh, the philosophy and, you know, the lifestyle of rock and roll because it became a lifestyle. You know, I started in, in music when it was pop back in the late 50s. Right. And pop is the sound you get when you put milk in the cereal. And mm-hmm. I worked my way from pop into rock. And rock came from, rock really started when the drums got off the click track. And all of a sudden drummers were free to play and kick the kick the guitar player's ass. That's the way I look at it. <laughs> but, but getting back to the opera, um, uh, Tuya and Maddie, the professors, Tuya, Tuya Tikal and Maddie Havry, were professors, and we crossed paths with each other in the university, um, uh, online with the university thing, because uh, uh, I was asked by the University of Western Ontario to do, actually to do a course. It was advanced studies in the entertainment industry. I guess they figured... They looked at my background. They said, "Wait a second. This guy's had a, really a lot of luck and a lot of success on the creative part of the of the of the music industry, and he's lasted and he's lived on music, so he must know something about business." And the University of Western Ontario has the biggest business school in that area in Canada, and mm-hmm. one of the largest music faculties. So they hired me to try to teach the students how to actually live and work in music, doing the business and doing the creative aspects. So I went there and I had this course and it was great. I hooked up with Maddie and Tuja over in on a tour that we did in, in Sweden and they asked me if I would go and maybe do a guest lecturing in, at the University of Helsinki, which I said, yeah, I'd love to, it would be great. And it was English, so it was pretty easy. And, and from there I did two or three universities while I was in Finland Hence, we started talking, and they came out during our a couple of you know a couple of uh, nights of wine and cheese, and you know the Finns can drink. You know that. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I know think. that. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't realize. I thought the Canadians could drink. The Finns, they're running a close second. Anyway, uh-huh. so we're sitting around, and they started talking about because Maddie wrote these books 
on mm-hmm. on uh, uh, research and genetic manipulation, mostly ethical. So when he says ethical, and he says, would you like to help us with a musical? We're thinking about somehow using the book stories of different, like, you know, stem cells and and uh, 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 cloning and stuff. And I'm, it's going way over my head. <laughs> Ray, I'm telling you, I'm looking at him with days. I say, you got to be kidding. <laughs> and he says, yeah, we, you know, we'll, we know what we want to talk about. We need some help with the music. So this was just, I said, sure, let's start putting down some songs. And they both play a bit. And we started working on, and it was just one of these uh, serendipitous things where you just start playing, and there was a, a guy there, an engineer, musician, who started recording it, and it started mm-hmm. making sense, right? right. It's kind of, all of a sudden, it started to come together, because it's really easy, or I shouldn't say really easy, but it's easier to write when you know what direction you're going. I mean, right. if you're an independent story, a songwriter, and that's wonderful. But it's challenging because you're picking things out of the air. You're picking ideas. You're picking a love affair. You're picking whatever it is out of a lifestyle. And in this case, they knew what they wanted to write about. It was mm-hmm. there were six little stories about you know um, involved stories about uh, ethical uh, ethical manipulation. Is it right or is it wrong? And it all gets down to perfection. That people want to be perfect. So. There's an underlying theme there that seems very Western, if you don't want me saying oh, so. Oh, sure. It's, got, sure. it's kind of like, well, wait a second. Here we're in Finland, and they're talking about cloning the perfect this and the perfect that. And mm-hmm. the, it's not so much you, there's a judgment on it. It's just a, a discussion on the ethics. How perfect can you make a body? You know, it's like playing God. So right. to me, that was, I'm thinking, wow. And I attribute that. You know, I, I spin off and think about music, and there is no perfect music. If there is any perfect music, you're talking Bach and Mozart, etc. But um, in terms of rock and roll, there really isn't any perfect rock and roll. As a matter of fact, rock and roll, or I hate the the roll part of it. Let's talk about rock. The <laughs> rock, rock it sounds like a deli, you know. Um, <laughs> but the uh, the rock aspect of it is part. It's not. It's it's not supposed to be perfect. Mm-hmm. Uh, anyway, so that's where how it came about, and the music, uh, the music, and the players over there were wonderful, and they asked me to, you know, basically and uh, overall take a look at the concept and write around it, and and Tuja and Maddie would give me ideas for the lyrics, and and that's when it came about. And again, there was no, there was we weren't we weren't there was no purpose. In it. it was just to do it. It was the love right. of making an opera, a musical opera. And then all of a sudden, two just says, "Well, let's try it out. Let's go to. Let's try it out in Finland." And they got a theater, and then it got a call from another university in Basel, uh, Switzerland. And then we yep. got a call from uh, university in Paris to go and do, I guess, presentations of the opera. And right. it started to build. Bottom line is the academic people. The, the community loved it. You know why? Because it gave a bling, it gave some sex, it gave some stuff to the philosophy departments in these universities. Needless to say, if you have a friend, Ray, and what are you studying at school? And he says, well, I'm majoring in philosophy. You, <laughs> yeah. you go, what? <laughs> you, know, uh, you, you think? Right. And um, yeah. <laughs> so they wanted to put some sex in, or I hate to use the word mm-hmm. sex, but some, you know, some interest, you know, to sure. draw people into the concept of, of studying philosophy and what it means. In this case, of course, it's rock philosophy. And, of course, if you take a look at ethics, and you take a look at rock, it's both sides of the spectrum. Go sure. figure, right? What are you going to do? So that's, <laughs> that's the... I'm a little bit out of breath here, right? That's how, the, that's how the opera sort of came about in capsule form. And the good news is it's a, it's a work in progress. We did a sold-out performance at this big theater, the K Theater in New York City. Oh, and great. it was just wonderful. They had pe- all kinds of people showed up. And we videotaped it and that, but we're going to do a quintessential uh, show with uh, four or five cameras when we do our uh, Gloria Theater performance in April. And we're going to really do a first division job on the filming of it, so then we have it, so we don't have to drag 20-odd people around the country, around the world, to perform it. At the same time, if we can cut it back, if we can do certain things to 
you know, to, to make it more effective, poignant. It's a pretty complicated. It's a pretty complicated subject, as you probably saw. And um, but you know what? It was it was just a very. It's still challenging. We're still working on it, and um, it just keeps the mind going. And I think it's. Uh, I think there's something to say about ethics these days. And not yeah. that I, you sure. know, I don't want to be presumptuous or pretentious and say that I, I get it totally because I don't, you know. But I'm studying it, you know, and. Um, it's just, it's wonderful, Ray. It's just, a, it, you know, it keeps that mind muscle and sure. keeps it going, you know. I love to see it on Broadway. I mean, Broadway's always been good to rock operas, you know, in the yeah, past. Yeah, they have. It may, yeah. it, this is the thing, Ray, you're right, you're right. It may, as a result of doing this proper video, this, I hate to call it a video, proper, a proper film, they're doing, uh, they have all this high-end technology now at this theater. So mm-hmm. we may have, it could be very cool. The format could be very advanced. Right. And yeah, it would be nice to do something like this. It, it's um, it's it, it's I don't know how to say it's complicated is not the right word. You just it's not like a, just a whim. It's not a very mm-hmm. it's not a, I hate to say it's not very commercial. It is in a lot of ways. But the topic itself, when you remind people about something they have to think about, a lot of people don't want to think. Right. And you know, I mean, we all say hell with thinking. You know, I remember with Leonard Cohen, I think the 80s came about, Leonard Cohen says, people don't want to hear lyrics, they want to dance. You know, they don't want to, they don't want to and that was his career going down the twos. Because yeah, I know, poet, I'm you know? just the opposite. Yeah, <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, the point, but there, you know, they have these wave of trends that go down, and that's what you live with, you know. Exactly. And uh, which comes first, you know, uh, the dance or the, or the music? I right. always think, no matter what, when I play anything, I really, my first priority is you got to be able to dance to it as a yeah. drummer. And then, of right. course, after that, it goes wherever it goes. But dancing is very important. But, you know, um, yeah, it's great to be a drummer. That's all I could say. <laughs> it most, it, and, Ray, it is the most beautiful instrument in the world. It, it is. is. I mean, it's got, it's got all the blings. It's got yep. the beautiful round curves. It's got, I mean, come on. Yep. It's the sexiest instrument there is. And, by the way, when you look at a drummer, especially a rock drummer, I think, in most cases. Jazz drummers, too. Mm-hmm. You watch them, it's like choreography, like, the you know, ambidextry. Everything is moving in their body, you know, and, and it's going, and yes, it's striking the drums, and you got pulses, and you got rhythm. But it's really like, I used to love to watch a lot of the drummers when I grew up. I mean, Keith Moon was like an amusement park. He was like, it was like a circus watching him, you know, and I remember seeing Keith Moon and going, I want to be him. And I think, what was I, maybe 13, 14 years old, I remember saying, wow, I really love that. Look at how much fun he's having. I mean, when you look at a sax player, it's hard to say, is he having fun? You know, or is his lips <laughs> chapped? Or, you know, does he have bad breath? I don't know. <laughs> you, you know, you told me in the last interview that you watched Keith Moon uh, behind you. You were in Madison Square Garden, I guess. You were right yeah. behind him. Yeah. And everything he did, you watched everything he did for three days, and you, you still couldn't do one of them. Is, is that what, why? Why is Keith Moon so hard to uh, you know copy? I guess. Well, I'm sorry you can't talk to him in person. I don't. <laughs> I really believe it. He doesn't know what he was doing specifically. Right. Uh, technically, it, it was just all passion. He heard it, went through his head, and he just interpreted with his body. I mean, he did fills on the drums that, mm-hmm. uh, in, every, in any case, you would never expect. Right. And, and the way he did the fills, I mean, sometimes he was totally in another time signature. I mean, I really looked at him as an amazing jazz drummer because mm-hmm. he did swing. And I don't know, it's just the joy. The joy of drumming is it's like the joy of cooking. And both the both both pretty similar too um it's just you know it's i i can go on as you probably noticed i do go on about drumming because uh, you know it's you you play and i love the idea that you don't have to be on a click track you know in other words when i look at the the drummers that are really celebrated these days who are remembered classic or non-classic are the guys that weren't attached to an electric sequencer or, mm-hmm. or, or a, um, you know, a metronome. So, right. the, you know, the main, you know, like Bill Ward from Black Sabbath or, mm-hmm. um, you know, uh, you name the, you know, John Bonham did not have a click track, you know. He played with the freedom. It's all, like, symbolic, 
Ray. I, you know, the whole idea of the freedom of playing off a click track and feeling that and at the same time moving people. I mean, it's monumental when you start right. figuring it out. And, and it's, it's just, and it's effortless. It's effortless. You don't so, have to, so, you so, so define, define off the click track. Off the click track to me, and it could sound like I'm a little bit out there and did too much drugs in the 60s, but I have to, to me, it's the freedom. It's okay. the freedom of playing as a drummer. I was very fortunate. I had Felix on bass, and mm -hmm. when I started, I think I was a kid, I think I was 19 when I was playing with Felix, and he would just say, you can do anything you want to do, just make sure you show me the one so I can come home. <laughs> you know, I, could, I could come home at the end of the song. And that was my, that was, that was my job, to make right. sure no matter what I did in the window of time that the song was going on, that I showed them the one every now and then. And I had the freedom. You got, I got to tell you, and I, I just remember, you know, as the time went on into the 70s, these drummers were getting attached to the click track. And then as from Foreigner, I remember, I said, mm -hmm. that, great music, great sound, but they were locked in. They were yeah. locked in to a, to a click track, and there's that part of you that's limited. You know, right. it's, like, it's like getting in bed with a woman saying, by the way, she tells you, don't get hard. <laughs> I, don't know. I don't know. That's that's not a good metaphor, is it? I got to change that. One. But what I'm getting at is you're only doing it part way. You're not right. doing the whole deal, and that's what the that's what the click track means to me. I had a long talk with Bill Ward from Black Sabbath. They said, mm -hmm. you know, you set a tempo for an entire cult of people, a yeah. society that just nodded their heads with you. I said, you know, that's taking over somebody's heart. Mm -hmm. Yes, you, when you when you listen to songs, you take and it goes to your mind, and you know you trip out on songs because they're beautiful and they make you cry. But drummers make you move. Yeah, and that's if right. we if we stop moving, we're in trouble. We got to yep. keep moving, and I believe the drummers of the the rock drummers keep mm -hmm. a certain generation going. I mean. Yeah, that's, I don't know, again, I can go on, which I seem to be going again. Shut me down any time, Ray. Just shut it down. <laughs> well, I agree with you 100%. One of my favorite drummers also that I, I got to do a Skype interview with, he, he, he's a great guy, is Billy Cobham. Oh, Billy's you know, he, wonderful, yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. Another Billy, I have guy. a little story with Billy. When, okay. when he was playing with his band, with Larry, Larry um, uh, what was the name of that band? Uh, the early 70s, West was 73. Billy Cobham, the guitar player, Larry, was it Larry? Anyways, he had a great band, a jazz right. band. It was all okay. jazz. And Billy was playing a single bass drum. And he was right. watching me play double bass drums with West Bruce and Lang. And I was, you know, going, going crazy on the, on the drums. And after the show, he says, by the way, Corky, how do you play double bass drums? Mm -hmm. I said, pretend you're running from the law. <laughs> and I didn't realize, I didn't mean it as a racist thing, but <laughs> I had him call him back, and I said, Billy, 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 Billy. No, I didn't mean it. He's laughing. <laughs> yeah, just get on there and pretend you're running, you know. And, uh, and sure enough, sure enough, Ray, he got the double bass drums. And, he did, and yeah. Amazing he did. drummer, yeah. Yep. Amazing drummer. Well, you also made uh, a statement with your cowbell on Mississippi Queen, <laughs> and, you know, that's... People always remember that cowbell in front of Mississippi Queen. Uh, it, it's just, you know, one of a kind thing. And I've heard the inception. Lots of people have heard the inception of Mississippi Queen, the song, which actually you wrote. Can, can you tell the audience about that? Yeah. I, well, initially I was uh, again another story. Hold on, everybody. But, right. Uh, we were in Nantucket with my local band. The name of the band mm -hmm. was Energy. Energy, right. And we, mm -hmm. yeah, and we were playing in the small beach club. It was amazing. You know, the funky beach club in Nantucket. And the lights, all the lights in the in the, that night, one night, a huge Saturday night, sweaty, hot Nantucket evening, the lights went out because everybody on the island put on their air conditioner. Now, we're going back to the early 60s. Right. Where people didn't have air conditioning in beach places. They loved the air. No, right. these, these were new, new houses with air conditioning. So the lights go off. And a friend of mine, Roy Bailey, is out there, and he's a hog. He is a horny <laughs> hog, and he's got a gorgeous, he's got a gorgeous girl who I had met before, you know, that afternoon. And uh -huh. he's dancing. Her name is Molly, and she's got a see-through dress, okay, this, a skin-colored see-through dress. And they're dancing, and the lights go off. 
And, you know, everybody sweat. Now, what Roy wasn't going to stop dancing, and he just screamed at me, keep on playing, Cork, you know. And I was playing Cripple Creek. I remember. I was playing sure. down on Cripple Creek, you know, shoot, yep. shoot, 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 shoot. And yep. I just, and the lights went out, and, of course, all the organ went off, the guitar. I'm, I'm unplugged. I, I, I think I had taken some soul pills that night, and, I, and I'm screaming out at, the, at this girl. I'm saying, keep on dancing, and I just threw out Mississippi Queen, you know, because she was from the South, Molly right. from Mississippi. Mm -hmm. And I screamed out over, and, and I, my voice went. There was no mic. I was screaming. <laughs> and you, I didn't want to play the drums because they were too loud, so mm -hmm. I played the cowbell. And there's a, a really weird recording that somebody did way back on, I think it's out on an English label, you know, one of those uh, old, uh, you know, bootleg things. Anyway, so that's the way the song, there was no music, it was just me screaming, Mississippi Queen, you know what I mean? And I would blink at her and i try to get, I was trying to pull her from Roy, you know, that was right. my job, you know, why not, right? See if you can, right. you know, the drummer gets some, come on, give the drummer some. Anyway, so that's the way it started. That summer, when I hooked up with Leslie and Felix, uh, Leslie said, you got, you got any songs? You got any ideas? I said, yeah, I actually have this, this, I wrote out the lyric to this song, Mississippi Queen. I finished it, you know, when I went to New York. I just, you know, I always wrote down things. And Leslie put the lick on it. And it was like, it wrote itself in the limo, mm -hmm. as they say. Sure. You know, it just come out, and we went in the studio that night and banged it out 14 times. And the only thing I could do to keep the time together, because those guys had those huge sun amps, and they had the Marshalls, mm -hmm. you name it, right. in the studio, it was yep. deafening. So the only <laughs> way they would, I couldn't say, one, two, a one, two, three. You couldn't do that. So right. I was smashing a cowbell, kick, kick, kick. That's the, and sure enough, they came right in with the lick. Mm -hmm. So we go to mix the record. And and I, I remember the, I said to Felix, well, you could pull a cowbell out now. That was just for the that was just for the temple. He says, you got to be kidding. That's the coolest cowbell. In so there you go. <laughs> that's a great. That's one of the greatest rock songs in history. Right well, thank there. you. It really thank is. Thank you. Yeah, really I, 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 it was also one of the rowdiest concerts I've ever been to. It was Mountain. <laughs> <laughs> Which one was that in Florida? No, this was in D.C. You know, I'm originally oh, from D.C. That was, yeah. I think it, was that that was an American University, was it? Was well, it Georgetown. One, yeah, hey. one of them was Georgetown. That that one was with Spooky Tooth. If you remember that show, that's you, right. You guys yeah, Spooky Mick Tooth. Jones. I remember that yeah. because they didn't have any lights on the stage. They no, it was a yeah, dirty super trooper. Everybody right. was getting laid in the audience because <laughs> there was no lights. <laughs> I, I remember <laughs> that. It was it was wild. You're right, yeah. Ray. That was wild. I remember. I, all... I think the, I think the sharks opened the show up. It was the sh yeah. sharks, Spooky Tooth, and you guys? Yeah, that's right. I remember that. They came on I, the road with us. Yeah. That's I think wild. Leslie, I think Leslie West came out and said, "Welcome to the Midnight Special" or something like that, because the Midnight Special was popular at that time. Yeah. It was a great no, show. No, we great did. Show. Yeah, that was. Uh, I I do remember those. I mean, a lot of people think, "Ah, oh, you're yeah, well, on drugs." You know what I mean? No, I never yeah. played Stones. I always made sure I got stoned after, because really? uh, well, because you know I I was yeah, I just why well, I didn't know I didn't yep. not that I remember anyways. But, <laughs> um, <laughs> that's that's, a, that's funny. right there is a the stab in the back. Okay, so what happened was I always got a buzz after the show to try to keep the buzz of the show up. Right, you know right. you smoke a doobie after and you just keep you keep the adrenaline going. But I remember that show, Jesus, oh yeah, because we did we played. Georgetown, American yep. University, and there was yep. one other. We had a good time. The hmm. college stuff was really happening then. I don't know oh, what's what? going on now, but, you know. Yeah, I don't know what happened now, you know. It's, it's well, I tell you what, it's the same anymore. I don't know. It's just, it, well, I'll tell you what happened. It's computers. I mean, kids will go upstairs and watch porn. They don't have to go see them now. <laughs> yeah, they watch porn on their, uh, on their smartphones. <laughs> That's right. Now it's moved right up. But it, it really turned around pretty quick. You know, I'm sure the colleges are doing great, and uh, yep. they have their own scene going on. And it's, um, you know, right. things change and stuff like that. But oddly yep. enough, right, at, at a lot of the shows that I'm playing now, a lot of kids show up. A lot of uh, you know, college kids show up at it. Yep. I don't know. I think their grandparents told them about Mountain, and they were curious. I guess you know, but um, they come to the show. We get a very young crowd coming out, if anything, for curiosity. You know, right. and and I think uh, from an organic point of view, when you look at Mountain, or you, when I play with these guys, whether it's Joe or or with Phil, 
they they're just plugged in. They they don't even have a wireless guitar. They they're mm-hmm. plugged in the old fashioned way. The umbilical sure. cord goes to the amp, and you know you see everything you see is what you hear, and mm-hmm. vice versa. And you know it's just a complete landscape picture of right. rock, and mm-hmm. that to me is very pure. And you know I'm an old fashioned guy, but it's it's so old it's new. You know people mm-hmm. the garage bands come out. You get sure. the indie bands coming out. Yep. They're doing it. They're doing it because they love it, mm-hmm. and they're doing it without any tricks, as I say. Right. You know. Yeah, I like it without any tricks. You, you've got, uh, uh, let's say, in April, you'll be in Helsinki for the rock opera. Yeah, we'll be there a week. We've got two or three shows there in okay. Helsinki. And, and Yeah, that'll be April. And then in May, we're going back. I think I got this right, Ray. Uh, okay. To, to the U.K., we're going to okay. be doing some, some festivals in May, and, um, uh, you know, that's as far as I can foresee right now. <clears throat> hey, listen, I remember, like, 30 years ago, I didn't know what I was doing the next hour. It's really... <laughs> yeah, I, I know. I, I'm, very, <laughs> I, I'm, very, I'm very impressed with myself that I can tell you this shit, you know? Yeah, it's I don't really know bad. how you guys did it back in the day. I mean, that's <laughs> it's crazy. Well, I, I remember when, when I was playing with Noel... Uh, he, you know, they were touring. Hendrix was touring right before Mountain. I mean, the, the years before, and right. he would tell me they just, they just kept those son of a guns, just working and touring all the time. Where they right. get the gig literally two days before, and they get to the promoter. Okay, we're going to this park. You know, to get get a stage. You know, oh, it was just very spontaneous. Right. It was pretty wild. So, um, you know, these days it's all like planned six months mm-hmm. ahead of time. You need lead time, marketing, and stuff. I have to say, I, 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 I don't miss that marketing aspect. There's a right. lot that goes into it. Of course, I wasn't involved, but, you know, it's, it reminds me of, let me bring this back to you, Ray. Uh, my okay. favorite guy in the world was Levon Helm. He still is, God bless him. He yeah. said to me, because we were talking about sequencers, and we're talking about plugged in and all the wireless, yada, yada, midis and, and cities and whatever it is. And he, I remember he turned out as a quirky. He says, you know, music's a special thing. Mm-hmm. You can do anything to music. Music don't care. <laughs> I just remember, music True. don't care, of course. Right. Music don't <laughs> care. What, what you do to it, you can do anything, as long don't as it music. works. Right? Yeah. You're, you're the only guy that didn't go to Woodstock, but you got two gold albums. <laughs> <laughs> That's, That's right. pretty cool. That's my favorite story. You know, I tell you, that story <laughs> does not get old, but and I, I have to say, I use it. I'm corny when it comes to that shit. But when you hang up two gold records on your beautiful village, you know, brick wall, and you're yep. kissing yourself to death, and you go, wow, I got two gold records to Woodstock, and I wasn't even there, you know? <laughs> you know, I, I got to admit, I did not know that was you on I'm Going Home on the live version yep, of Woodstock. That's me. Well, I did not know very, that. You can barely hear it, I mean, you know, yeah. the, the, the way it was mixed. But I get a yeah. kick out of that because Rick Lee, the drummer, I run mm-hmm. into him here and there. And right. he says, Corky, will you fucking stop talking about it? They make me look bad. <laughs> <laughs> well, what happened to him anyway, Rick Lee? He's still around. Oh, no, he's playing. Uh, well, well, what, what, what happened to him for what, in uh, oh, the Woodstock? Uh, Woodstock. Track. Not, yeah. Nothing happened to him. The, right. He didn't know. The mics didn't work. They were off. Oh, crap. You know? It's the same when it's the same thing when when Mountain played the the uh, the train festival, you know, the Cross right. Canada festival, which the uh, ex- tra- I guess it was called the Express, the mm-hmm. Rock and Roll Express. Anyways, they forgot to put the film in the camera, so we were never <laughs> in that. <laughs> you know, it happens, babe. You know, they, those were the uh, days. But so the mics didn't work. You know, they right. didn't, they didn't work at that point. Oh, that was a joy. That was great. That was great fun. You know. Yeah. To, yeah, to me, that was probably the the best performance. On the show was Alvin Lee, even yeah. though you know it's a little repetitive, you know, him singing a little. Home. <laughs> a little, you think? <laughs> but he had a lot of energy, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Well, the point is, is that was yeah because there was a, there's a time and place for everything, right? Right. And that right. was you know if you were on the stage at the right time. And those shows, you really got it down, you know. Uh, you're oh, yeah. lucky. I mean, a lot of it was serendipitous, you know. And yep. You never know what was going to come up around the corner and bite you in the ass. But I tell you what, you, I just happen to be very lucky. Again, I'll mm-hmm. drop a drummer, Bill Buford, right? And I, oh, yeah. And, and he's, his whole philosophy is, it's all about when you were born, mate. You know? <laughs> <laughs> which, which comes down to it. I, I happen to be, and I, I, you know, I think I told you, Ray, I said, you know, 
as a teenager in the 50s, you were a nobody. But if you were a teenager in the 60s, you were everybody. Everybody. And right. I happen to be lucky, and you're lucky. You were a teenager in the 60s. Right. Everything came with it. The whole ball of wax, you know, was great. Yeah, I miss those days a lot, you know, just for the fact that radio was so great. You know, I mean, you yeah. know, where, where can you listen to the Beatles and Frank Sinatra and, you know, and who knows when? Everybody yeah. else, Mountain on, on Top 40 Radio. Yeah, yeah. that just, was. Can't yeah, do and they're trying to replicate that, you know, with a lot mm-hmm. of the new, uh, the new programs. And the whole idea about radio is there was a guy there talking yep. about it. Either he's drunk and he's screwed up, <laughs> yeah. but there was a personality with the dish jockey, you know, Wolfman mm-hmm. Jack was a perfect example. Oh, I love Wolfman Jack. Yeah, he was and, my you know, idol. Uh, yeah. yeah, and uh, they had Cousin Brucey and all. Yep. I mean, you listen to it, and it's, as a matter of fact, I did a show 1989 in uh, the Levitt Pavilion in, uh, in Westport, Connecticut. I did an all-star show. We had mm-hmm. Meat Loaf. We had, uh, what's his name, uh, from uh, the Average White Band. I had mm-hmm. Felix Cavalieri. I had Levon Helm. I called in all my, fa- my, my, my favorite friends, and come on in, we're going to jam. And actually, Mick Taylor was there, too. Oh, and really? it, was, yeah. it was great. And I'm trying to figure out why I'm telling that story to you now. It's just <laughs> that, <laughs> that, that, just, that just left with the tinnitus in the left ear. I was telling you that story. Oh, I know why it was. It's because... No, We're I don't about know. I like that. Uh, yeah, Ray, this is the most embarrassing thing that can happen. I, it left me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we were we were talking about Wolfman Jack and all those guys. That, oh, you know, that's so, right. Thank you, cousin yeah. Brucey was Cousin Brucey was the MC. Oh, was he that, really? Yeah, wow. I have these photographs, and you know what? It was kind of. I just remember his voice when you come down from Montreal and you mm-hmm. drive through Vermont and you come down, and then you come to New York and you hear cousin Brucey. You know you've arrived in America. Yep. That's oh, right. it's just wonderful, you know. <laughs> uh, it's funny, it's coming, what happens is that when you cross to the other side of 50, you get very sentimental, in case you haven't noticed, you know. Are you still now, there? Uh, right. Yeah, I'm, I'm here. Okay. I mean, I was listening to you, actually. Yeah, uh, no, it's just the sentiment. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I feel like Ra- Rambo. Oh, you should have remembered back in the 72 when I fell off the drum set. Yeah, exactly. that's where they got the idea for Spinal Tap. Yeah. <laughs> I talked to uh, Tommy James uh, about a week ago, yeah. and when he appeared on Ed Sullivan, he said he swears that Ed was drunk, that, that usually he drinks, and that's why he can't pronounce the, uh, the names of the bands <laughs> that are on there. <laughs> that's great. I believe yeah. it. I, oh, you got to believe it. I mean, can you imagine what he was thinking when he had these... These bands, I mean, Frank Sinatra and all that, yeah, those guys mm-hmm. come on, and, and Tony right. Bennett. But all of a sudden, these, these kids come on. i got to hand it to him. The fact that he let it happen, you know, he's really responsible for, for launching, launching yeah. an entire, and that's Uncle Ed, you know, and right. uh, God bless his soul, you know, that there's these guys, the old guys, they don't quite know what they're doing, but they, they feel something's coming around. It's going to bite them <clears> in the ass, you know. It's great. It's really cool. Yeah, we wouldn't have gotten... Uh all the great acts if it wasn't for Ed, but I, I wish he had done a little homework <laughs> before, <laughs> before he introduced well, the band, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I love when he came, at, when they all came to say hello to him at the, you know, after the, uh, and you're Jim, uh, you're Jim, oh, uh, <laughs> yeah. Jim, and, and oh, yeah, I think he was loaded. I think yeah, he was. Yeah, you're, you're Ringo, or you're Paul, or you're, who, who's John? Are you John? <laughs> I remember we were supposed to, well, I remember seeing Carmine. And uh, and what is it, Vanilla Fudge, yeah, right? Yeah, and they were yeah, on. Okay. And I remember seeing. That, I said, "Geez, I hope we get. I hope Mountain goes." And I wasn't in Mountain, but it was way before that. And uh-huh. I said, "Wouldn't it be great for Mountain to play Ed Sullivan?" And what yep. happened is there was some talk of it, and he just went off the air. He I went off the air. Nineteen seventy or sixty right. six, and he went off the air. So we lost that baby. But you know, there's certain things you say, boy. Is there somebody you really want to play with? And I have to say, watching Elvis Presley do his martial arts, I thought to myself, boy, I'd love to drum behind that. You know, do the accents and all that. (laughs) Can you imagine being behind Elvis as he pushes those punches and he kicks? And he was able to move in those days. It was great. It was was great. So that's the one thing. I'm. You miss a few, Ray. You know, you win some and you lose some. But I I have no regrets. No, I don't. No, it's very cool. No, man, you've been around everybody. All the greats, you know. Well, you know, yeah. yeah. Like Bill Buford said, it's about when you're born, mate. Yeah. (laughs) 
<laughs> and I was happy. I'm happy to be born, and I'm happy sure. to still be here. And it's great yep. to talk to you. And uh, you know, uh, yeah. And if we come to Florida, look out because we're going to take Definitely. you out. And um, yeah, we're going to get the band back on the road. Um, now, now uh, what, what, you, can you name some of the songs on your set list? Yeah, I can name all of them if you want. Okay, I, I didn't want to spoil it. <laughs> let, me, let me just get let me just get mountain climbing out. Okay, well, we don't look around, which we never did. Okay, sitting on a rainbow, which we never did. Right. Traveling in the dark, which we never played on stage. Hmm. Um, never in my life, of course, we played. Uh, sitting on, excuse me. Um, Ba, ba, da, ba, silver paper, one of my favorites. Mm-hmm. I remember Noel had he did an Irish version of Silver Paper. Like, really? Sun is shining on my world, <laughs> sun is my shoes. It was great. Anyways, what else? Um, that took a sleigh ride, of course, which we yep. played. But when Leslie and I, over the last, what, 25, 30 years, played it, it didn't sound like Nat Tucker Slave. Now he had keyboards in it. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I think what I did do is I said, you know what? I'm going to tell you a quick story. Warren Haynes was playing New Year's Eve at the right. Beacon Theater in New York. Okay. And uh, Matt Ash, the drummer, invited me down to come down. And he tells me that New Year's Eve, this is the night before New Year's, he says, New Year's Eve, you know, we had our audience, we asked them to tell us the favorite song that Government Mule would cover. And it came up, uh, one of the three favorites was Nantucket Sleigh Ride for a Government Mule to play. So Matt Apps comes up and he says, listen, tomorrow night we're playing Nantucket Sleigh Ride. I don't know if, if Warren told you, how does that 5-4 thing happen when you do the fill in the sleigh ride, you know, bam, 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 mm-hmm. bam. And I said, I looked at him and, and I'm saying, and he says, I can't get it. I said, well, Matt, excuse me, but I'm right here, you know, <laughs> and why is Warren not like saying, hey, Cork, you want to play? Mm-hmm. I was a little bit, I said, what's going on? Matt says, you're right. So he takes me upstairs to the dressing room on the night before, and I walk in, and Warren's sitting there, goes, oh, he says, Cork, i got to tell you. He says, of course I would love you to play. He says, but i got to tell you, I've been, the last 10, 15 years I come to see you and Leslie play, I don't recognize the songs. Leslie's jamming out on these things, mm-hmm. and he's not playing, you know, he's not playing the original arrangements, etc. Right, right. You know, because he's played them so much, he, you know, he expands on them. Mm-hmm. And he says, I'll tell you what, Warren says, he says, if you can learn Nantucket Slay Ride, if you can learn the drum part mm-hmm. uh, and come in tomorrow afternoon and rehearse with us, you can play it on New Year's Eve. You oh, bet great. your ass. I, went, I drove back, I put on the CD, and you know what, Ray? I had forgotten all my parts on that tuck and play. Right? <laughs> you really? I had, to, I had to go back. I spent a couple hours because it goes through all the time changes. Oh, no. Anyways, because I played it with Leslie, but nowhere near the same arrangement. Right. So what happens, I go the next day to rehearsal, and we do it, and he's got a big smile on his face, and he says, <laughs> all right, we're on for tonight. And it was a big thrill. At that point to play Nantucket Sleigh Ride exactly like the record, and mm-hmm. Warren sang it. And that convinced me that, wait a second, this is probably a lot of people feel that way. You know, I remember right. some yep. of the shows Leslie and I did out in Armpit, Nebraska, a guy would come out, why didn't you play Mississippi Queen? I said, we did. And he said, I didn't recognize any Mississippi you know. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm thinking, you know what, it's a good idea to give the people, and for myself, it's for me, mm-hmm. To play yep. the songs exactly like sure. they are on the record, and that's why I named it. You know, I yeah. play Mountain, and it's very clean. And you know what? The people that love the songs, how mm-hmm. many are left is one thing, but the people come out, they love it because they're not like I'm not scamming or promoting a new record. You right. know, I'm playing the songs for the love of the songs. Thank God, it's some of the most beautiful material that Felix yep. and Leslie wrote. Sure. And you know what? You got to be blessed with the material. The repertoire's got to be right. there. So I figure, why not? You know, so that's why I put these guys together and hit the road. And God bless, God bless the audience. They love yep. it. You know, they're hearing it the way it should be done, the way it originally was done. And if they hadn't heard it before, they're hearing it for the first time, and hopefully, it's fresh. You know? now, now, sleigh ride is the lyrics something to do with cannibalism or something like that? Oh no, that the no? dedication was to coffin. Uh, okay. You're going to see you're going to see a movie that's coming out now. Right. with the heart of the sea or something that, okay. uh, that, that uh, you know, they're putting out. It's the story of Moby Dick, and it's, it's right. got to be beautiful. Right. It's coming out actually this week. Is that song is in the that? Story, that's the story of Coffin. Of really? What, yeah, where they had to, yeah, they were out yeah. to sea. They had to eat each other. And the, wow. Felix dedicated Nantucket Sleigh Ride mm-hmm. to, uh, what's his name, something Coffin, uh, 
Oh, jeez, I can't remember his first name. Owen Coffin. His name is right. Owen Coffin. And Jesus, the memory's working good with you, Ray. You're sparking this thing. <laughs> Jesus, I'm having a fun. It's all like sparks going on. I'm having brain farts up here. Man. We are from great. the 60s, you know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's right. I wasn't even there, and I'm enjoying it. Um, but uh, that's Owen Coffin. Yeah, that's the cannibalism. Was it's Again, right. it's just coincidental that this movie's coming out. Um, mm. uh, who is the guy, Robert, uh, the producer that he did Apollo 13? What's his name? The, he's a great produ- director. Uh, Robert, Bob, uh, I can't think of his name, of all things. Mm. Um, anyways, um, it's, a, it's going to be a great movie, and it's, it's, it's well done, but it's, it's the Nantucket sleigh ride. That's what that movie really is. It's the big boats going out huh. and the long boats. It's quite, mm-hmm. it's quite something. Yeah. Right. Now, did you know, Gail Collins, she, she kind of wrote some of the lyrics of that, right? Was it Gail Collins? Gail Collins did, yeah. I feel like yeah. his wife. Yeah, she did, she did a great yeah. job on it. Well, it's a folk song. Uh, right. Uh, it's a goodbye, uh, goodbye, little uh, Robin Marie right, was, my, right. was my girlfriend mm-hmm. in Nantucket before mm-hmm. Felix even went to Nantucket. When I huh. used to go there in the summer, she's a doll. She was a real, like, hippie, crafty chick. She's right. a doll. Like, beautiful. And I used to go there, and we used to have, she had a knitted blanket, <laughs> and she's like, blah, 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 blah. Anyways, <laughs> Felix fell in love with Robin Marie. And, of mm-hmm. course, that's why he used that, you know, goodbye, he just used her, her name in that. All that's right. pretty historical in a way. Yeah, it is. It yeah, is. Pretty, yeah, and, um, <laughs> yeah, well, of course, the Nantucket Slayer right, is what happens when, you mm-hmm. know, like Joni Mitchell said, you know, right. the the, uh, the machine, the machine mm-hmm. takes over and puts you out there. You yeah. know, star-making machine, okay. Yeah. I, I, think, I think Gail died uh, last year, right? Yeah, a couple of years ago, <laughs> yep, she did. Uh, she disappeared. She disappeared. That wow. was, oh, I tell you, that, that whole thing was so <laughs> weird. That was, you know, between Felix uh, being yeah. shot and, and, and that whole <clears throat> trial and stuff, whoa, mm-hmm. you know, that was over the top. And, um, yeah, I was going to think about making a movie called Boom Boom mm-hmm. and about Felix. It's the life and death yeah, of Felix. That, but, yeah. you know, it's kind of like these days trying to get any movie done. You're, you're, gotta, right. you're in a bottleneck. You know, there's so many things going on out there. And they're right. all good. They're all good things. That, all that the docu- was- you know. Now, was Felix doing heroin with her it, it, during the days of Mountain, or was was that well, something? Well, you know, did? I hate to, I hate to you know uh, you know to to tell on anybody. Everybody was doing everything. Right, you know, right. Class A narcotics was the trend for everybody, mm-hmm. and then you hear about Eric Clapton coming off and yeah, Peter Townsend. Yeah. It wasn't it wasn't like the, an Hollywood junkie thing. It was like mm-hmm. these guys had a lot of money, and if anything, they were just trying to stay buzzed, you know. Right. And as you get older, the buzz seems to disappear unless you find yeah. yourself a real eighteen year old girl, you know. And yeah. That'll bring the buzz back, you know. And <laughs> you know, it's amazing how heroin is making a, a tremendous comeback. It is. You know? It's too bad. It's too bad. Yeah. I don't think. Well, you know, what it is. It's the painkillers. It's the painkillers right. that you know. I, I, when you find out how cheap heroin is compared to buying, you know, those other things, I don't right. know about it, but uh, yeah. I want to make that clear. <laughs> um, <laughs> No, I, I, you know, there comes a, there comes a time where you pass that those you know rites of passage. You know, I right. think you know everybody's going to go through what they're going to go through. But I'm sorry to say that I think that the medication, as we call it, had a lot to do with the stupidity and the recklessness that went on. Right. And had it not gone on, who knows? You know, anybody could talk mm-hmm. about what could be. But the point is, it is it is very sad because Felix died at a time where he could have had a resurrection. Mm-hmm. You know, and he was a brilliant, brilliant. He, he was brilliant. He was he very brilliant. brilliant. Yeah. yeah, and that's that's where the luck comes in. You know, between yep. him as a teacher and Jack Bruce as a teacher, yep. you know, two bass players, but well-rounded, mm-hmm. brilliant musicians. I was lucky. I was sitting in the best seat in the house. You know, yeah. that's where I was. I was sitting right there, enjoying it, sucking it all up. I was a yeah, and, sponge. And you met you met Felix in your first band, right? Energy. That's right. He yeah. produced "When I Fall in Love." Yeah, that yep. old that. Yeah, I mean it's 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 the way things were going on, and it's a real small business now, if there is any business. As right, you know, right. Right. The paradigm, the paradigm for rock is so different now. It's so mm-hmm. well organized. It's pretty, and in a lot of cases, it's almost anal. But uh, I think there's ways to work around it <clears throat> and just enjoy it and for what it is. Sure. You know, take it for what it is. And you're one of those people that really does enjoy it. I find well, there's I, a pa- yeah. Ray. I find, without schmoozing you, I find there's a passion 
in what you say and how you express Thank you, you know your enthusiasm for music and yeah. the you know it's they're hard to find hard to find that kind of personality and nowadays it is it really is yeah. you know i i did research when i was a kid i mean i i like mitch miller i you know i went back to my uh uh mom and dad's era you know, yeah. my my mom was Cuban, uh, you know, Celia Cruz back in yeah. the day, you know, and things like that. Um, dad's music, uh, you know, back in the 1920s and 30s, you know, kids don't do that today. And, and they've no. got, you know, they've got everything at their disposal to find out about these people. Yeah. <laughs> I, think, the I think if people, let's put it this way, if you love music, you will mm-hmm. eventually do that. Because you're right. right, you can dig into Google and, and just get into that Get anything whole, you want. Get right. anything you want out. I mean, uh, coincidentally, my I'm Canadian, so we had a lot of Cuban music come yep. through Canada. Sure a lot of the Cubans came up there, and uh, mm. and I was lucky enough. My mom would play, you know, all these uh, Tito Puente and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. It, was, yeah. it was great, and that's why I had the cowbell because I always, <laughs> right. well, I always, I always loved, you know, the yep. timbales and all that. You know, right. you're not you're not going to get a louder drum than the timbales, and that's what I needed when I played right. with those guys. That was the only thing that would cut. You know, on yep. stage, and uh, you know, uh, I remember Bobby Rondinelli. You know, a great sure. drummer, and he. Uh, I remember I was playing somewhere. He says, "Cork, where are the timbales?" I went, "Oh man, you know what? I was all the time. I had timbales in Mountain. I was dying to get myself. I couldn't afford. Well, I finally could afford yep. to get tom toms. I, <laughs> I felt I felt I was in the. I feel like a trailer park drummer. You know, like I said, yeah. I couldn't afford to get the tom toms. And yep. sure enough, Bobby says, "You're a stand man. That was a cool." So yeah. I had top timbales made up, and I have them now again. I'm back yeah. in the timbali land. Oh, know. cool. Well, I'm glad yeah. I got to get, got to hook you and Joe up on the phone anyway, Joe Lala. And, oh, know, that Sally, was great. God bless Sally, him. Sally, he yeah. passed away not, not that long after that. So Yeah, yeah. I did speak to him. You know, I was in touch yep. with him. We were trying to hook up. It's yep. just that I think at that point I was heading out of town. Yeah, Joe Lala is one of those wonderful people, you know, yep. just, you know, and... Uh, yeah, well, they're all playing together now. I yeah, that's right. They're, they're all up there. They're having that's a right. great time. You know, they're not dealing with ISIS and all that. They're up there. <laughs> exactly. They're, you know, <laughs> they don't have to worry about Trump. <laughs> <laughs> you know you, what you I, get, you got, There's a movie coming out uh, next month, I think, in, maybe in Canada, uh, Liberty Village, somewhere in heaven. And, and oh, you're really? in that, right? Yeah. Where did, where did you see that? Talk, it's uh, Liberty Village, Somewhere in Heaven, the movie. It's supposed yeah. to be released 2016. I think it's like a half an hour, 30-minute movie. and it, it's... Well, that's funny because it, and there's a place in Toronto that right. they did a movie on called Liberty Village. I don't well, you're in it. it. Oh, oh, Wiki- it? Wikipedia, uh, you're in it. Think, are they releasing that? <laughs> yeah, in 2016, I think. No, <clears throat> where, where did you hear that? Uh, Wikipedia. I just punched it in, uh, Liberty Village, Somewhere in Heaven. Yeah, and it said I think you were interviewed. Yeah, I was. I for the did the movie. I, yeah, and they're going to play mountain music, and it's going to be for the archives, I think, in Canada. Oh wow! Like that. Wow, yeah. that's wonderful. Yeah, the guy that yep. did it was he was trying. I remember him coming upstairs. He says, "Do you mind if I film?" And right. my and my wa- well, Taffy, Taffy uh, decorated my apartment, and she's mm-hmm. like, a, and she did a beautiful job. It was, and I, I remember he came up to the apartment. He says, "Wow, this is like heaven." I, that's, I remember I said this. I said, no, I'm living in heaven up here. It was like an apartment overseeing the city and the village. Right. It was very cool. That was the best part of Toronto was that village. You know, oh, the, you know I talked to uh, David Clayton Thomas. Yeah. And we, we, we talked about, you know, I mean, his, his, all his um, uh, music that he began playing was because of that. And all the great artists that came, I guess, into Toronto, uh, because there was a, uh, I guess there was a uh, color barrier in the United States where all the yeah. R&B players could only play like Detroit, places like Detroit. Right. So they all came to Canada instead, and all the great yeah. R&B players played in Toronto. That's right. That's funny yeah. you mention that because I, I actually been writing little blogs to myself that I went to see Sonny Terry and Brownie McGee in mm-hmm. Montreal. And yeah. they were freezing their little uh, testosterones off. Because, <laughs> well, because you're right, they did come into Canada because, yep. uh, you know, the Canadians, they don't know about all that stuff, or maybe they did, but they didn't show it. So I guess as, as long as people can handle the cold, they're fine. And between you and I, musicians really don't like cold. You know, right. I mean, right. you know, uh, but um, in general, you're right. That's it, Clay. Dave, David Clinton Thomas, before Blood, Sweat, and Tears, he had mm-hmm. his band, uh, 
Bartholomew Plus Three and the local band I had, Energy, we mm-hmm. were like the Montreal pop band, and David Clayton Thomas was the the Toronto thing, and of course, Blood, Sweat, and T went to New York and picked up on a few right. of the, the guys right. in, in the village there, and they put that band together. Um, but that was, yeah, that was that Canadian scene. The village that was around for David Clayton Thomas was Yorkville. That mm-hmm. was Yorkville. That's right. for all the folkies, you know, going right. to Lightfoot. Uh, Ronnie Hawkins, the band, they mm-hmm. came from that. They came from the cock right. door in Yorkville and, you know, Ian and Sylvia. Um, uh, who did uh, We'll Sing in the Sunshine? Gail Garnett. Wow, mm-hmm. I, that's a big one. Yeah. That's a, that's a big Yeah, they all came from the village, and that's when Albert Grossman went mm-hmm. up to Yorkville and got... Gordon Lightfoot, and as a result, he got yep. Bob Dylan and that. Anyways, yeah, a lot of history there. A lot of history That's huge. That. Yeah, you know? that was huge. Yeah, and I, I talked that. to Randy Bachman about it and um, also um, Burton Cummings, because they, they Cummings, all kind of, yeah, yeah all, all good guys. All good guys. They're all good right? guys, yeah. yeah. You know, you have Rush, those guys, Mahogany, yep. Rush. There's yeah. A, yeah, there's a lot of good Canadian artists that you just, they get. I don't know yeah. if it's true, but a lot of guys say, no, I don't want to fight all those Americans, so they just stay <laughs> up there. I don't know. The way things are going, maybe I'll move to Canada. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's true. I, I, Hello, I, cold. I, well, listen, we got Justin Trudeau, right? He just yep. got in there. That's that right. Is, that right. is such a blessing because, yeah. you know, I know my, I'm not that much into politics, and I've right. been out of Canada for right. a while, but when you flash back to Pierre Trudeau, those mm-hmm. were the golden years in Canada politics. He changed right. so many things. He was so ahead of his time. Mm-hmm. And then all these kind of like uh, real uptight kind of conservatives got in there. Right. I must say some of the conservatives had some good ideas. They mm-hmm. didn't go to Iraq and all that. That's one thing. But without getting deep into it, Justin, Justin Trudeau is going to be a real player in the world. He's a kid, and he's going right. to change us like the kid that changed the planet. I exactly. got a feeling he's going to be very, very cool because he has no, you know, he has no preconceptions. He's going to do what he feels. Right. You know, I just, I just hope he gets the support from the other leaders of the country. You know. Anyways, yep. I'm sorry I'm on that. I just read. That's okay. Read some, read some we're, today. We're, 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 kind of, we're wrapping things up now, Corky. Anything else you'd like to promote? Uh, what about the Memory Thieves? Are they still together? Are you, are you still doing concerts with the, the Memory Thieves? The Memory Thieves, no, what happened, no. It's, it's, I'm not going to get into it, but Josh and okay. uh, the Memory Thieves went their own way. The girls okay. went ahead and they started a band. No, that sort of went its, went its own way, but when right. I'm on the road, we have a, a compilation that has the Memory Thieves on the CD, so it's cool. That was a cool. wonderful, that was a wonderful yeah, it was good transition. Band. Yeah, it was really yeah. cool. I mean, it's music. We're all a work in, pro- we're all a work in progress, right, Ray? We yep. just go through these things. And <laughs> just look at, all you have to do is take a look at Bob Dylan That's and you truth. realize, okay, I'm in the loop. You know, you got it. You Cor- know, we're Corky, make, make sure you give me a collar or email me or get uh, to Asia to uh, email me on Facebook or something when you're in Florida. And we will we'll definitely. See we, we'll see if we can have lunch together or something. That sounds like, that sounds good. <clears throat> that sounds like a plan, and we'll do that. In the meantime, Corky, you, have, you have a great go holiday. You know. You too, man. Thank you so much for being on the call today. And more importantly, man, for all the incredible music you've given us with Mountain, Fletch, Bruce, and Lang, and Into the Present with your brilliant rock opera, Playing God, and Corky Lang Plays Mountain. Thank you Thank so much, Corky. You. Thank you. Happy holidays, support. man. Okay, you too. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye now. Be sure to visit CorkyLangWorks.com and PlayingGodRocks.com and purchase the brilliant rock opera Playing God by Corky Lang and the Perfect Child, available at Amazon.com. I gave it five stars. It's an awe-inspiring rock musical production and a cross between Welcome to My Nightmare, The Wall, and the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Very special thanks to the beautiful Tuisha for uh, arranging this interview today, uh, to each of Polite Bystander Productions uh, for hooking us up uh, with the legendary Corky Lang. And please join me bi-weekly, Mondays at 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern, on the Ray Shasho Show. If you have any comments or suggestions or would like to be on the show, give us a call um, at 941-877-1552. Or email us at ray at publicityworksagency.com. Have a great week, everybody. Thank you for listening to the Ray Shasho Show, brought to you by the Publicity Works Agency. Call 941 877 1552 or visit us at 
publicityworksagency.com specializing in author and music artist publicity plans we shine when we make you shine join ray shasho every monday at 3 p.m pacific 6 p.m eastern on bbs radio station one